Well, good morning. Um, I want to welcome you all for participating in today's training, and we're very excited to be able to offer this training today. Um, we have two regional consultants from the Piedmont region, um, and Kathy McElroy, who's a supervisor in Bedford, and they're going to introduce themselves and they will take over the training. Um, I, I would ask, I think Marnie sent out a, a message asking this, but if you're not speaking, if you could please mute yourself. It does help with background noise and those kinds of things. So I will let um, you guys take it from there. Marnie, were you gonna start? Yeah, I think it might be nice if everybody, um, you all you know, know your folks better, if you wanna call on people just for quick introductions okay. um, to the group before we start. Okay. Um, I found it's better rather than saying, everyone introduce yourself if you want, just want to call on folks um, it's, so people don't talk over each other. Um, okay. But I think it might be nice for everyone to just say, hey, this is who I am. This is my role. Okay. Well, I'll start with the way my screen looks. And <laughs> I know it can change. And if I end up missing somebody, please let me know. So, Kathy, you're upper left. <laughs> Hello, I'm Kathy McElroy. I supervise foster care and adoption for Bedford County. And I'm sorry I didn't introduce myself either. I'm Sharon Harris. I'm the part-time advocate manager in Bedford. Beth Grieber? So? Yes, there we go. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I'm a CASA volunteer okay. in Lynchburg City. It looks like Sharon may have froze. So I will say I'm Joanne Williams. I'm the full-time advocate manager in Bedford. Um, Dawn, you're next. I'm Dawn Barnes and I'm a CASA advocate for Goochland, Virginia. Uh, Dawn Wilson. Hi, I'm Dawn Wilson. I am um, one of the Piedmont Permanency Consultants, and I support um, most of the agencies, nine agencies in the area surrounding Bedford. So I do Bedford, Lynchburg, Appomattox, Amherst, Pennsylvania, um, and some others that are a little further away. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mike, Margin, you're muted. Mike, you're muted. Can you hear me? Now we can. I'm sorry. Uh, this is Mike Large. I'm a CASA in Central Virginia, uh, so far in Bedford County. Thank you. Uh, Al? I'm Al Gorman. I'm a CASA volunteer in Bedford. Darnell? Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Darnell Wood, and I'm a CASA volunteer out of Bedford uh, County. Shante? Good morning. I'm Shante Hudson. Um, I'm a CASA volunteer in Lynchburg City. Gloria? I'm Gloria Braxton. I'm a CASA volunteer for Lynchburg and Amherst. Thank you. Kendall? Hi, I'm Kendall Berry. I'm Advocate Manager in Appomattox uh, in Campbell County for CASA. Bart? Hi, Bart Fletcher. I'm a uh, uh, volunteer CASA in Lynchburg City, and I do some part-time independent contractor work for Bedford County as a home study writer. Uh, Deanne? I'm a CASA volunteer in uh, uh, Nelson County and also working in Amherst currently. Um, my screen is moving, sorry. JR? Uh, Casa Volunteer in Lynchburg. Thank you. Joanne Perkins? Good morning. I'm a Casa Volunteer in the Northern Neck of Virginia, Lancaster County mostly. Thank you. Katie? 
Hey, good morning. My name is Katie Agnor. I am a CASA volunteer for Bedford County. Octavia. Hi, um, I'm a CASA volunteer in Amherst, although before that I served in Lynchburg. Carol. Hi, um, I'm a CASA volunteer in Bedford County. Kelly. Hi, I am the Recruitment and Development Coordinator with CASA. Tanya. Tanya, if you're speaking, you're muted. All right, we'll come back to her. Um, Allison? Hey, I'm the Executive Director of CASA of Central Virginia. Um, Beth, we're doing introductions. I'm not sure if you just joined. If it's Beth Gruber, I introduced myself in the very beginning, but I'm a volunteer CASA for Lynchburg City. I lost track of where I am because it's moving. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> uh, is there anybody on that I may have missed? Yeah, from and Kelly and JR. D this is Eliza Calvatone. <laughs> uh, I'm a volunteer in Lynchburg City. All right, thank you. Um, is anybody, is there anybody else that hasn't introduced themselves? Like my screen keeps jumping all over and now I think I lost track. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. This is uh, really exciting to see so many folks um, joining us today. Don and I are really excited. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, just to prepare you for um, what to expect, I'm going to talk a little bit about the state audit process and kind of how we got to prioritizing a kin first culture. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my and, and Don roles um, in general, kind of what a consultant role is and how we support locals and then talk a little bit more about um, kin first culture and then Don will talk about how um, prioritizing placing children with kin relates to um, the permanency um, position that she's in and then we're going to turn it over to Kathy um, who will talk about what that looks like in in a local department so you sort of see the big overview picture sort of from the state level and then how that looks at a local level. And of course, we want this to be really interactive. We want you to be asking questions um, and you can type them in the chat if you'd like, um, but we're gonna sort of answer all the questions at the end so that um, myself and Don and Kathy have a chance to get through our content. Um, but we really do want this to be informative for you. Um, and there are no dumb questions, so don't, uh, I know people always say that, but um, we really want this, um, you know, to, to be something that is beneficial and helpful to you all in the good work that you're doing and supporting the families and children that you serve. So I, I wanna begin by talking about JLARC. Um, some of you may or may not have heard about that, um, but JLARC is the Joint Legislative Audit Review Commission and they conduct program evaluation, policy analysis and oversight of state agencies. And they do that on the behalf of the Virginia General Assembly. In 2018, the JLARC report on improving Virginia's foster care system was released. One of the, recommend, one of the recommendations that they made in that report uh, was to prioritize kinship approvals. Um, and in that uh, definition of kinship, we include fictive kin as well. And that would be someone who the family or the child identified as being important to them. That could be something like a godparent, a coach, a teacher, 
um, something like that. So that, that's now included in kinship approvals. And so um, policy and guidance that's related to child welfare is created by the state and then interpreted and administered locally. I think you all understand that, but I never like to assume anything. Um, one way that the state provides support and technical assistance to the local departments is from regional consultants. So in 2018, when that recommendation came out to prioritize kin, um, the state kind of restructured the regional consultant positions. So now there is what's called a resource family unit and a permanency unit. And so I am part of the resource family unit. I'm the resource family consultant for the Piedmont region. And I support the local departments in recruiting and training of foster parents. Um, I'm going to let Dawn talk about what she does when it's her turn to talk. Um, and Dawn has, an, some of you probably know Dawn from working at a local agency. She's incredibly knowledgeable and we're so delighted to have her um, with us, or at least I am because I'm still new at the state. Um, but, but Dawn is wonderful, so you'll enjoy hearing from her in a little bit. Um, so in terms of kinship approvals, some of the things that I want to highlight, um, and you'll hear Kathy talk about this in, in real-time practice, and she'll give you some examples, um, but in terms of kinship approvals and, and why it's been prioritized, I want to highlight a couple of things for you. Um, one of the biggest things that it does is it reduces trauma for children having to come into care, right? If you could think about someone in your family who might struggle and have children and them having to enter foster care for some reason and going to a stranger, think about how scary that would be for that little person you know, right? So when we're able to place children with people they're familiar with, it, it reduces the trauma. It makes a lot of sense, right? Um, you're going to grandma's house or auntie's house. Um, there's already routine established. You're familiar with it. You're all those things. It's, it's not a stranger. Um, so the reduction of trauma um, and um, trauma for the families, right? Not knowing where your children is, is, is placed or where, who are they with? Where are they living? What does the family look like? Um, it can be really stressful, right? And one of the things that we often talk about is that the parents we serve whose children come into care are the kids themselves who probably didn't get what they needed when they were younger, right? And so this is traumatic for them too, and that's important to remember. So it really, when you look at the whole family system, placing with kin reduces trauma for everybody. Um, it also maintains connections to the child's family, right? Which is really important. Um, kids need to maintain a sense of their identity um, that's one of the things that you'll hear children talk about over the course of child welfare um, is that that significant loss when they're not able to stay connected to the people that they love and that they know. So those maintaining those connections really important. Um, the other really positive thing that we've seen and, and the data shows this um, is that siblings are more likely to be placed together. Um, and that's huge. When siblings are separated, that again creates a whole nother level of trauma for the children. Um, and so, so that's been a really um, wonderful thing. Um, as I mentioned, cultural and racial identity are more likely to be honored and preserved. Um, we also see fewer placement disruptions when children are able to be placed with their family. Um, and we see a greater, higher um, rate of reunification. And so those are sort of the highlights of the reasons why placing with kin um, are really important and being prioritized. And so that's, that's sort of the big overview picture. And I, I'm going to let Dawn take it from here. OK, thanks, Marnie. Um, we're, we're excited to have Marnie on board with us. She came from the Charlottesville area. Well, she lives there. but. Um, from an organization up there that did really excellent work with Ken, so we're excited to have her. So my position, um, <clears throat> I do offer guidance to um, local supervisors and staff around our guidance. So I support nine local agencies. I used to support all 24 local agencies in the Piedmont region, um, but with JLARC, 
they wanted us to have more consultants so we could be more focused on individual agencies. So um, I, I work closely with Kathy and supervisors from other um, local agencies to help them kind of interpret guidance, um, here to bounce things off of them, in addition to things like, you know, looking at data and all those, that fun area. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so what I wanna talk about initially is really how what we've done with our guidance that supports placing and working with relatives and kin and fictive kin. So, our guidance, we have really changed our guidance over the past couple of years to really focus on relatives. Um, and some of the things that Marnie was talking about, um, like adding fictive kin, which is now in code and guidance, it never used to be. So now we are um, really focused on relatives for many reasons. But guidance is very clear that the expectation is to search for, engage, and consider relatives for children in foster care. Um, and consider relatives for both placement and for support and just relationship with kids. Um, in foster care, this is a requirement at the beginning of a case and throughout the life of a case. And we have really talked more about that um, is putting it in our guidance about when there are placement changes for youth in foster care, they need to research for relatives. Um, and the other thing that we're really, that, that the state is really pushing is relatives should not only be sought when a child enters foster care. At the first, the, the first contact that families have with the child welfare system in general, so if that's CPS through prevention or um, you know, through an ongoing case or an investigation. It's really, we should be looking at relatives throughout the life of the case. And when a child comes into foster care, the hope is that whoever in that agency was working with, the, with that family prior to foster care, they can kind of hand over maybe a list of relatives, the people they're aware of or people they've spoken with. Um, so it's, it's very important that, that we are searching relatives at the beginning of a case. And again, our guidance says that, and, and we also have it at placement changes. And like I mentioned a, a minute ago, it's not just searching, it's not just sending a, a letter, it's also trying to engage them. So if you don't hear back from people, trying to, to seek them out, asking consistently. Um, and also, the letter that we send out does mention that we can consider them for placement. Um, and this is really Marnie's role um, in looking at placement, but we can approve relatives as foster families. Um, our guidance supports, so we have goal, as you, you know, there are goals for youth in foster care and kids in foster care. And we have a relative placement permanency goal. And that permanency goal can look a little different. Um, so it can look like um, a relative who petitions the court for custody and the court just transfers custody to that relative after a home study is done. It could also involve kin gap. Um, so in, in, in a kin gap case, a relative petitions for custody the, the agency um, believes they could be a placement option. Um, they approve that relative as, as an approved foster home. The child lives there for six months. They work with the local agency very closely to fill out a bunch of paperwork and go through a process to see if they could qualify for kin gap. And then custody can be transferred to that point, at that point with some financial support. Um, right now, Virginia has only a federal kin gap program, um, and kin gap stands for kinship um, guardianship assistance program. So that continues to give a financial support to whoever takes custody of that child. Um, <clears throat> the issue with the federal program is it's for for youth 14 and over, and um, because those are the youth who sometimes 
don't want to be adopted. They have a say at 14 whether or not they want to be adopted. So we, the federal program allows that for those 14 and over. Um, anybody under 14, there has to be permission from me, the regional consultant, um, to allow those youth, those younger children, to transfer custody using kin gap. But in those cases, I have to determine that the the agency has ruled out adoption and um, return home. With young kids, sometimes it's really hard to rule out adoption. Um, you know, it's not like we can give a family the option and say, hey, do you want kin gap or do you want adoption? Um, and they let them choose because a lot of times they're going to choose not to upset their family and terminate rights. So um, kin gap can be an option um, for those youth over 14 through relatives. Um, and we are hopeful to have a state kin gap um, option in the future, um, in the near future that would uh, change that that age so younger kids could possibly but that you know be um, have a custody transfer to a relative through kin gap but that's not in place yet um, when local agencies are assessing relatives they are assessing for safety permanency and well-being like every other um, case that they're looking at because um, I know sometimes there are concerns that relatives we let relatives do whatever they want. And, and I think Kathy will probably talk about that more, what they do at, at Bedford. Um, but in order for them to go through kin gap, they have to be approved as a foster parent. That means they go through um, every, uh, they have to go through all of the same steps as a regular foster parent. Um, as you know, the court has five things that the court has to determine when they're transferring custody to relatives, and local agencies do much of the same. They are looking at the same things. Um, willing and qualified, they have to be willing and qualified to receive the care of the child, be willing to have a positive continued relationship with the child, be willing to protect them from abuse and neglect. Um, they need to be willing to comply with protective orders and willing to participate in court reviews. Um, if it's appropriate. Um, but one thing that Marnie mentioned earlier is that in Virginia, we are state supervised and locally administered. So the assessment of relatives always lies with the local agency. We can give guidance, we can um, you know, put out there what we think is best as a state, but the local agency always gets to decide who they approve, who they don't approve, who meets criteria, who they will work with. Um, there's that we can't force them as a state to do that. Um, we have conversations, but again, that's that's on the local. Um, and also, as you, if you, some of you work it sounds like in different courts. As you know, different courts do things very differently. Um, so there's there's that. One thing we are really moving towards is um, supporting relatives even outside of foster care. So prior to kids having to enter care, um, and I don't know if you all have um, heard anything about Family First, but we we're moving in um, that we're moving money from the back end of foster care to the front end of child welfare to really support families in their homes and with their own relatives, like their relatives outside of foster care. There are some new options that came up, uh, I don't know, in the last several months where there can be some TANF options available outside of foster care. Um, and certainly Kathy or your local agency can give you much more information. That's a benefit function. I do not do benefits. <laughs> um, I do not do that end of the house. Um, but there is, there is a financial, um, there's some financial incentive for people, for children who would have entered foster care, but they go live with relatives. And we're also really beefing up our prevention services through the state. Um, so when we talk about um, relatives in the foster care world, what options are there? Um, there are really three different options for relatives when kids are in foster care. 
One is for them to petition the court for custody. They go through the home study process and custody just gets transferred through the court. The other option is the kin gap that I spoke about where the relative is approved, kids placed there for six months. They go through a, a, um, a adoption, like a the same sort of system that goes through for adoption assistance, if anybody is familiar with that, but it's kin gap assistance. Um, referral and then custody is transferred and then there's also the option for relatives to adopt um, their relative kids. Um, some agencies, if any of you work with Lynchburg, um, Lynchburg does an amazing job at getting relatives to adopt kids. I will say um, there's kind of a, a myth or some old thinking out there that when you terminate a parent's rights, all the relative rights, rights go with it. Um, and I, I guess maybe in a legal sense that's accurate, but remember the local agency gets to decide what happens for kids. So if, a, if they terminate parental rights on a parent, but the local agency believes an aunt and uncle is a good support for this child, they can decide to allow that. And they can still, if it's an aunt and uncle, a maternal aunt and uncle, they can still approve them as a foster family. They could still transfer custody or have that child adopted by them. So um, that's really up to a local agency, but it's still an option to work with relatives, even when you have termination of parental rights. Um, the, uh, um, something like that Marnie said earlier, the longer a child remains in foster care, the potential for trauma um, and difficulty forming strong relationships increases. The effects of being in foster care can have lifelong impacts on the child, and I think we all know that. Um, but when we think about that, we think about, you know, moving kids and, and accessing relatives. Um, one, one thing that we have put in our guidance to strengthen relatives is once we have a child placed with an approved relative home, um, you can only move that child from that home through abuse and neglect or a court order. Uh, unless everyone agrees, let's say that the relatives of I can't do this, if everybody agrees, that's one thing. But we've had some protections in our guidance to um, allow relative placements to keep their children. Um, and then just wanted to mention one thing, and, and, and Kathy may talk about this some as well, but you know, there's a lot of thought out there about relatives. Um, I, I worked in a local agency for 15 years. I, was, uh, I worked in Campbell County with Sharon, and. Then after she left, I supervised that, that agency. And I've been guilty of thinking some of these things myself years and years ago. And, and, but we've really changed the thinking about, um, you know, that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree and that, you know, grandma didn't do a good job parenting her child. That's why she abuses this kid. You know, we really believe that we want to believe that relatives are appropriate every time until someone proves us that they're not. Um, the other thing that I recently heard, and I think maybe Lynchburg says this, and I love it, is that there's not a competition as far as, as we at the state, there's no competition between a foster parent and a relative. The relative wins every time. Um, I don't, so, you know, I, I've heard and I've heard in the past, I still hear today when working with locals, well, I don't want to move the kid because they're settled and they're doing well there with a stranger foster family. Um, and so when, when locals come to me or I'm guessing when they come to Marnie as well, her response is probably the same, is that um, it doesn't matter, like relative wins. The relative, that's where the child needs to be is with the relative. Um, so we hear that, we hear they're so stable, they don't wanna make a move. Um, the other thing is we hear that we hear is um, they don't know the relative, they're a stranger. So why would we take them and put them with a stranger? 
Well, we put them with a stranger in a foster home that is approved by the local agency. Um, and even six months into a case, if you find a relative at a placement change, or you find a relative or somebody comes out of the woodwork, we really want you to consider them and our guidance really supports that. Um, the other thing that we hear a lot, well, they knew about the abuse and neglect that was going on. They knew about it and they didn't do anything about it. And I think we can't judge families based on um, very little information. The local agency has to assess them. And our guidance does support that. So does the Code of Virginia. Um, so to say that our guidance and code really support relatives, every time we are revamping guidance, we're increasing what we're putting in there about supporting relatives which really helps the local agencies make decisions on what they do with relatives. That is really all I have. I think I'm going to um, give it, hand it over to Kathy. All right, thank you very much. Um, I used to um, have a foster parent uh, worker before she retired and, and she would always say, we find homes for children not children for homes. And I think she put it very well because a lot of people come to us with the hope of adopting and um, that's really a, a byproduct of what we do. That is not our, our true role. Our role is to keep children with their families, to return them to their parents or to get them with family members when they cannot be returned to the parents. So we specifically recruit kinship homes for our children in care. I'm not going to say this is always easy. Um, we have a situation where a baby has been in a foster home since pretty much since birth. Um, we are uh, beyond the termination. Uh, we've um, kind of gotten a, a little too far out on the timeline. So we're going to termination now. And paternity was just established right before the uh, TPR hearing was set. Well, these foster parents had assumed that they would be adopting. Now we've got a grandmother and an aunt who just found out that they have a baby in their family and they are coming forward. And we did hear that. Um, and it is hard to sometimes wrap your brain around it. Um, this baby has been with this foster family pretty much since birth. But I think in the long run, it will be in this baby's best interest to be with family. Um, I, um, I had a dear friend um, who was adopted by a lovely family, um, but he has no idea about his medical history, um, just something as basic as that. Um, and he's going through all kinds of medical issues. Um, he has no idea what anybody in his family looked like. Um, um, those kind of just things that we take for granted every day. Um, as Marnie said, um, it is much less traumatic for a child to be able to go into relative care. Um, I was able to uh, keep three of my little cousins for a summer while their mom um, was able to get her life straightened out. Um, it was all by surprise and we live in a one bedroom house so it was um, very interesting. Um, but when the children would become sad or upset, I could say, well, let's call grandma. And for me, it was completely natural. I just picked up the phone and called grandma. I knew who she was. I've known her my whole entire life. Um, I could call them by nicknames that my uncle had given them. Um, and immediately they would know the situation I was referring to. I could tell them stories about their mom when she was little. Um, I can tell them stories about themselves when they were little. Um, it just gave so much more health and wealth to their situation. And it's funny back then, we kind of divided up different areas of our house for them to sleep. And even as teens and even as young adults, they will still come and grab, now we have a bigger house, but they'll grab this couch or, or that bedroom and kind of camp out. Um, and it, it's really neat. It has really um, enriched our family. And fortunately for them, they were able to maintain and go back to their mother. However, if they were not, um, they didn't have that trauma of being completely separated for her. What I found is that uh, being able to place a child in a kinship home reduces fear and trauma, not just for the child, but also for um, everyone. The foster families don't know our families. And so they have kind of like innate fear. Um, are they safe for me to be around? What do I do if I run into them at the grocery store? Um, um, you know, should I be talking to them alone? Um, 
placement with kin eliminates all of those concerns and makes it so much easier. Um, we have recently dedicated a position for our kinship recruiter um, engager. Marla Martinez is actually a kinship provider herself, and it's an issue that's very near and dear to her heart that she understands. So she is actively recruiting either traditional foster care placement through families or that uh, change of custody that has been talked about. Um, not all families are in a position where they're able to foster. Uh, number one, this is not something that they've dreamed about or thought about. Uh, it's something that landed in their lap one day. Um, so uh, they're not really prepared a lot of times to take all of the training and meet all the requirements. Sometimes like me, they didn't have a home big enough for everybody to have their separate room. Well, for us, it was a lot more fun and better to camp out um, than it would have been to take the children and s sever their relationships from their family so they could all have their own bedroom. Um, Marla will meet with these families, um, talk to them about their options. She can help set them up with TANF and Medicaid payments if they don't want to foster or if they want to foster and then have those uh, supports after they get custody or she can walk them through the kinship uh, approval process and, and get them approved to be a placement for that child. And she understands the importance of doing this in a really speedy fashion. Um, if we have a child come into care today, we might need to find a relative and place that child in that relative's care today. And for, like I said, for Marla, this is real. This is something she values. So she will put in those extra hours and that extra energy to get that done. She understands the situation and these families can relate to her. So she's like a tremendous engagement machine. Um, as has been said, um, the, fam the children have a cultural match. They are able to um, maintain their religions. Uh, they're, and as has been said, um, the families are willing to go out of their way more often to keep the kids in the same school. Right now, our kinship numbers are down in Bedford. We have just three children in kinship care, but we're working on at least six. I'm hoping to um, move children from traditional foster home placements to kinship care placements. Um, we, um, Marla, like I said, she'll hook them up with financial benefits so they can maintain. She'll hook them up with training. Uh, she refers them to the Kinship Navigator Program, which is a grant program based um, out of Patrick Henry Family Services, but it serves the counties of Amherst, Appomattox, Bedford, Campbell, and Lynchburg. Um, and they can just call this uh, Kinship Navigator and she will set them up with uh, support groups, resources, um, advice. Uh, names, just whatever they might need, and, and she's there for this specific purpose. Um, the needs for kinship care providers are very different from those of foster home providers, and somebody sometimes people see them as being more needy and not as appropriate, but as I said earlier, um, kinship families do typically have a lot more needs for support than our typical foster care families because these kinship families had not planned on this. This is something that was dropped on them. So they're unfamiliar with the system. They're unfamiliar with the court system. They have, they do require a lot more support. But as I said, um, it, our relatives oftentimes see mom and dad grow up as um, little children. And so they're not scared about dad throwing a fit and coming to their house. Um, they knew little Davy when little Davy was five and they've always been able to handle little Davy and, and aren't scared of that. So um, they can work out things that non-relatives can't work out um, and they that's what they want to do um, it is just so much more natural um, we have uh, several many successes where the children started in traditional foster homes and moved to relatives and those relatives and the traditional foster families now are kind of added to the same family. Um, there's a, a local business um, in Lynchburg that uh, the, they're foster parents and they took in one of our children. He came in um, severely abused and they rescued him to, uh, and, and took him and got him healthy. And in the meantime, we were able to find grandma and grandma was able to become his placement. Well, I still see this little child in the foster family's business ads on TV. And it just makes my day every time I see him. I've been able to see him grow for years now, but he goes to their home on weekends sometimes. Uh, he, they go to the grandma's home. It's just wonderful. He gained everything instead of losing everything. Um, it, it makes um, a tremendous difference. 
Um, as Dawn said, when children come into care, I immediately do a computer search for relatives. We talk with the, with the family and interview the parents to see who they will name, but then I do a relative search and do that through periodically throughout the case um, to find relatives, um, even if they're, they're out of state. Um, we work really hard um, to, to, to find them. Um, sometimes against the preference of the biological parents. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons uh, parents won't reach out to their families and a lot of it is shame-based. Um, and that's understandable, but something we can help them work through. And once we help them work through that, um, they've got some natural supports in place. We see when children are able to return to their parents, when we have their family on board to support them, they are much more successful long term and those children are much less likely to re-enter care um, because all the family members, um, that secret's been broken and all the family members are there before you know, for them and, and truly invested in keeping these children uh, together. We do have one kin gap case um, and actually the, the young lady was, she's a teen and she was able to be placed uh, in her brother's custody. And this was just wonderful because she is a teenager and that is a bad word sometimes for our traditional foster families. They're scared of teens and don't want teens. So this was her brother. He wasn't scared of her, was willing to take her on. And when she came into care, she had one baby and was pregnant with another and she was 14. So um, that's a lot for uh, traditional foster families to wrap their heads around um, and or even want to take on. Um, um, I think a lot of traditional foster families uh, are just so scared of teens and especially girls, excuse me, overcome um, because of, of their possible sexual activity. And here's a young lady who proved that she was sexually active and prolific, but um, we were able to quickly transition her to her brother before her traditional foster home placement broke down and, and, and she's thriving there. Um, she's doing very well and her brother has continue to involve the, the, the baby's fathers in their lives. He wants to make sure um, that these babies have their dad in their lives. Um, so it's just been a wonderful situation. Um, trying to look at my notes. Um, that's really kind of the gist of what we do. And um, like I say, it's not always easy. Um, we tell our traditional foster parents over and over and over again that we look for kin, um, but sometimes if you place that little child in their home, they fall in love with them the minute they see them. So we know that we're breaking their hearts and we don't take that lightly, but we work real hard with the biological families to, to understand that and see if um, they would be willing to consider these foster families as, as an additional support for them. And most often they do. Um, so I'll just throw that out there. Um, any, any questions? Yeah, I mean, I think to speak to Kathy's point, and I think um, this is what we're starting to see, you know, across the board is the way non-traditional or traditional non-relative resource parents are being trained, right? Um, and what we're seeing now is that during training, we are preparing them to be a support to families, not a replacement of their family, right? And it's really important they understand their role as a support and understand that the expectation is that they will be building relationships with the birth family so that when reunification we hope happens right that's what that's our goal we really want um, to have happen ultimately whenever possible that those connections still continue um, with the you know kathy's example i mean i can give some examples of, of times that i've seen that happen um, it, the system is far from perfect, as we know. I know Kendall put in the candle, sorry if I mispronounced your name, Miss Barry, put in the chat it was a, a very sad story. And I think that, um, you know, there's the old adage, when we know better, we do better. And there's a lot of different system of care, um, you know, that really need to be educated. Uh, I know in some um, jurisdictions, um, the, the judges, really need to get on the, the kinship train, <laughs> right? Um, and so there's a lot of work to be done um, to do what's you know ultimately in the best interest of children and their families. Um, but, but we're seeing more and more successes um, as we as a system of care do a better job educating the different pieces and that, and that education of a, of a traditional non-relative foster parent is really key 
Um, and so I know Bedford has done a good job in shifting how, how we talk about um, their role um, and, and that's happening more and more. So um, questions or comments or thoughts? Yeah, th this is Darnell, uh, and I'm a cost out of Bedford. I, I guess, you know, I understand the kinship care, uh, but how deeply, you know, if a child comes in uh, to Bedford County uh, social services, and I, I, I don't want us to see, or I don't want, I prefer, and I'm sure Kat, Kathy can answer, uh, answer this, you know, what, how quickly do we run out and try to find someone uh, as far as a kinship or a relative to the child, uh, as opposed to really investigating to see what their person's background is? You know, do we rush out to find someone just to find a relative? Uh, I, I, that's the angst I have with that. Uh, uh, you know, do we thoroughly investigate the family just like we would a foster care family or someone like that? Because in some of the cases I've had, and uh, the other family members uh, are just not up to par, you know, they don't have the financial stability and things of that nature. Uh, then once that child is put into kinship care or given to that relative, what what's can we do or what does social services do to go out and make sure that child is still uh, getting all the preventive care and all the care that they should get after they've left court? Um, that's, a, that's a really good question, Darnell, or good questions. Um, no safety requirements are waived when a relative placement is made. Um, a relative for Kinship placement much, must meet all the safety requirements that a regular foster parent would. We do all of the background checks. Um, they're not official in that we don't have that state signature yet, but, but all of them are done. Um, we, uh, we check court um, websites for um, criminal activity. We do their DMVs. Uh, we do uh, central registry, all of that. Um, we do a home visit before the children are placed there. And we, we talk to them a, a lot um, and to tell them about what our expectations are um, and to learn what their expectations are to get an idea of whether or not this is a good idea at all. Um, usually we're looking for a relative placement as the children are coming through the door if we have not already found a relative placement. And I know their case you're referencing because we had three relatives. Um, one, we ruled out immediately because um, we knew about um, some concerns in her home. Um, one we later came to rule out, um, uh, thanks to you and the, the worker's home visit, we realized that she didn't have adequate heat or financial ability. And one that we thought was viable um, ended up just falling flat. Um, so um, a lot of assessment and sometimes um, that waiting period when you don't immediately have that relative uh, does allow a lot of things to, to come to the surface, a lot of those concerns. Um, when we do place with relatives, we talk about um, that they can't just turn that child right back over to the parents because we'll just come right back out and take that child and, and, and replace it. Um, it's not sending that one door so we can come back in another. Um, we, we talk to them a lot about that. Um, we work with them either through Marla going in and doing some training one-on-one -on -one or through the relatives doing a circle of um, care, which is their kinship training, to help them uh, navigate the process and, and understand. Um, and I think usually the relatives themselves will tell you, well, I knew that something was wrong with that parent. I've known that parent since birth or you know, when they have. Um, and so I, I'm not surprised. I, I couldn't put my hand on it, but I, I knew something was wrong. And, and they, just because they're relatives doesn't mean that they don't have that natural protective factor. Um, in them. Now, sometimes we, we do. Uh, we get wind that the, the relative's plan is just to give the child right back to the parents, but um, we do talk to them about that and monitor very closely. Um, and, and, and Kathy, that's that, and you kind of hit on a point, you know, if they've seen something going on in this child's, uh, bringing the child up and they've seen some issues uh, and they didn't tell anybody, you know, they knew these issues were going on all along. Then we turn around. I should say we turn around. But somehow they get 
uh, care of this child. Now, I, and this, I'm just speaking as a CASA. You know, if they get care of this child, then, you know, they could be turned around and put that child right back in that same, although, you know, Bedford Department, no social services is checking them out every day. And uh, they could put that child right back in that same position when all along they knew what was going on, but they didn't bring it to Bedford, any social services, they didn't bring it up to anybody. And I think a lot of times they know something is going on, but maybe not exactly what um, and a lot of times they have brought it to our attention, but it did not uh, rise to be validated as a complaint because they didn't have enough information. So um, we rarely, we don't really encounter that many relatives who didn't do what they needed to do in the first place. Um, that's pretty rare. Um, and when that has occurred, usually those are the, re the relatives that we kind of weed out. Um, we really do look into them very carefully. Um, before placement occurs. Um, and one thing I think that helps is the children still remain in school. They might not remain in foster care or in services through social services, but they remain in school and we've got eyes on them in the school and, and the school will let us know if something's going wrong. We also do family partnership meetings um, and family team meetings um, at least every month and bring as many relatives on as we can. So if there is something um, going on under the table, uh, there are other relatives who are more likely to speak up and bring it to our attention. Um, it's not foolproof, um, but we do work really hard to make sure the children's safety is uh, the, the utmost consideration. Um, and we don't just go to court and say, hey, we met this relative, she can't be a foster parent, but give her custody of the children, we have really investigated them before we make that recommendation. We've done home studies, uh, background checks, um, been in their homes, observed them with the children during visitation, observed the children after visitation, um, talk with the parents. So um, I guess we're kind of using our more soft skills in that situation, but but we really do everything we can to, to figure out what's going on and prevent more harm to that child. All right, thanks, Kathy. And I think it, I think it's um, a fair point to say that um, whether it's a traditional non-relative home or a, or a relative home, you know, it's incumbent upon the local department to do that thorough assessment. And, you know, it's all, I mean, we, we've all seen traditional foster parents that said all the right things and then it didn't work out. So, I mean, I think the thing to take, I hope what you take, one of the things you take away from this is that, you know, families are going to be loyal to their family um, and, and it's complicated, but when you have that dedication and that love for that child that's been there, it, it, it makes it so much better for the child. And, and this, we really need to keep the child the center of this and think about what's in the best interest of that child. And, and, I, and, I, and I agree with that, Marnie. Uh, the, the, I guess the disconnect for me, and I hate to keep saying the disconnect for me, the disconnect for me is that, you know, if you got to go out and search for a relative for that I, child and you have to search for them, I don't think that relative has really been there for the child anyway. Well, let me, you know, I, what, what I think of when you say that is a domestic violence situation, right? And we know that in DV situations, the person who's being abused, I'll just say her because we know it goes both ways, but more, than, mm -hmm. more often it's her. Her abuser has kept her totally isolated and hasn't been able to reach out to family, right? And that, and that is... We see that with addiction. We see that with all kinds of mental health issues. You know, um, it's not that the family doesn't necessarily want to be there, um, but there, there are some circumstances that the family is just not able to. Um, and that doesn't mean they're not dedicated to the children, but by having intervention from child welfare, then it gives us the opportunity to work with that whole family system to get everybody in a better, more stable, healthier place to meet the needs of the child, right? Yes. 
Um, Ms. Horsley had asked, uh, what does a robust family finding effort look like? And I, I appreciate that question because yes, letters are just the start. Um, when I do the computer search, I get a list of the relatives and their phone numbers. So we send letters, we call, we interview every family member we can come in contact with about, well, if you can't help with placement, you know, we do invite them to be part of the team to continue supporting that child and family. But we start asking them, well, who do you know that might be aid? And then we go to the ne ne next person. Who do you know that might be able uh, to place these children? Um, so um, it's, it's not just sending out that letter and checking that box. Um, it is active recruitment, active calling, active visiting, active interviewing throughout the life of the case. Yeah, and I think as we move into this world of technology, social media is another um, technique that lots of agencies are now embracing um, to enhance um, their family search. And there is, um, particularly for older youth, um, some family engagement tools that we can use with them. One of them is called mobility mapping, where it's like taking a, a walk through their life with that child. And, and, and it's a, you know, it's a very specific technique with some very specific questions that really help um, identify places they've been, people they've come in contact with, important people in their lives. Um, so there's lots of different ways and techniques that um, we, can, we can use to really enhance that um, engagement effort. I will say, oh, go ahead, Sharon. Um, I'm just curious, if a, I know that throughout the foster care case, you, you're constantly looking for relatives. But when that comes really late in the timeline, like let's just say that there's already been the initial permanency planning and the court granted subsequent permanency planning. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, a relative comes forward. What, I mean, how is that worked with the courts and the timeline? Um, you know, because I think I've heard it said that there can be multiple permanency hearings and that kind of thing. I mean, if there's not adequate time to do a trial placement with a relative or something of that nature, um, how are those things looked at and evaluated? Well, we've got one of those right now, our little baby that's been placed with the foster family almost since birth. Um, we've had the first permanency planning hearing, um, and I think we were on paternity test number five before we finally found the father. Um, he's incarcerated, but his mother's interested and um, another family member's interested. And of course, this child does not know them, and this they do not know this child. Um, but they still have a right, they have familial rights. Um, and, and I will say, um, at first, it, my heart kind of sunk because it's like, oh my goodness, this poor little baby thinks its foster family is its real family. Um, what it's, what's it going to do to this child? But then I think um, future forward, um, I've seen so many adoptions. I've been here 30 years. I have seen so many adoptions that were beautiful. Um, they adopted these little fellas and it was heaven on earth, and then the children grew up and became teens and started exhibiting regular teenage behaviors, which can be really ugly sometimes, as normal as they are for a teenager. And the families turn them back in, the foster, the adoptive families turn them back in, where I think biological families are more tolerant um, and more willing to work with them. Um, we, we've gone through gluts of children re-entering care. Um, I think a lot of times adoptive families are looking to get that perfect portrait, family portrait over the mantle, a mommy and daddy and baby. Um, but as the baby grows up, they don't look so much like them. They don't act like them. Um, and they don't have any traditions or stories um, to, to take it back to, to, to maintain that bond. Um, so it makes it, permanency is, is much less likely to remain. Um, and I, I think just knowing who you are long term is of tremendous value. Um, I have a lot of relatives out there that I don't know, but I know where our family um, initially came from. I know my um, background. Uh, you know, I've got 
stories about this person there and that person there. I have inheritance rights. I still maintain inheritance rights, which once TPR occurs, um, that child no longer has inheritance rights. So even if my grandmother wanted me to get the family Bible, unless she thought to put it in her will, um, once my parental rights were terminated, I would have no legal right to that family Bible or things that are so important as you get older. Um, so I think it's important a lot of times not for us just to look at the current situation, but to think about it in the future, what's going to be in the best interest of that child. It's not going to be easy right now to make that tradition, that transition occur, but we can do it in a way that's as least harmful as possible um, to keep that family intact. And I understand the logic behind that thinking. I don't question that. I, I, I think I'm just ask, asking more from a procedural procedural standpoint with the court and the timeline. I mean, is there ever a time when the court just says, we're done? I mean, oh. you know. mm -hmm. Sharon, I, I, so when you were talking about that, um, we, we come from a court that does one permanency planning hearing and then one interim hearing. You can have one, you know, a second permanency planning hearing, that's it. And that's what code permits, that's what our guidance says. Um, many courts do go to additional permanency planning hearings, which, um, you know, is, is not ideal for children to, to linger in care. Um, but one thing to think about is that when you're at the end of a case and a relative comes forward, if you're gonna change that goal anyway, um, if you're going to be in a position where you must change the goal from return home, relative placement to something else, it's always, um, you know, the adoption goal is available for relatives as well. So if relatives are coming through at the end and as you're assessing them and really think, gosh, this is really, you know, they're, they're a good match. They, they check out, they've, you know, um, they could be a good placement for this child. You can have them adopt a child instead of just transferring custody um, at the end of the timeline. Yes, it terminates the, the parent's rights, but the child still remains within that family. Um, so that's an option. And then I, I just wanted to also mention about trial home visits because there are so, there's some confusion about who can have a trial home visit. Um, so relatives cannot, unless they are approved as a foster family, a child cannot go on a child home visit with a relative. A child home visit is only for a parent or a prior custodian. So there isn't a time where we can place a kid with a relative before transferring custody unless they are approved as a foster parent. Um, kids in foster care must be in an approved placement the whole time. Now, if grandma was the custodian, the prior custodian, the child came in care from grandma, you can do a child home visit with grandma prior to changing, um, prior to a custody transfer and trying to, to return that child home. Because in that case, that is also considered a return home goal. So I just wanted to make sure that um, we're clear about that, that, that we can't just place kids with relatives to see if it's gonna work prior to transferring custody. Um, they can do overnight visits, they can you know, spend the night, they can stay. The, the rule of thumb in foster care is no more than, um, no more than 13 days, 14 days. They can't, a, a child can't be gone from a placement for more than 14 days. So they can, you know, maybe vacation or spend, spend, spend some time there, but they cannot complete a trial home visit with a relative. And, I, and I'd also mention, um, back when we were talking about our search efforts, I think where Christy asked, is we have really beefed up our guidance around um, what locals can do to search for relatives, not just using, um, not just sending a letter and waiting for a response. Kathy, I'm sorry. Don, are you done? Uh, what's from the, is it six months from, if a child is placed in kinship care, is it, and is it six months that they have, and say if you go to court and that's six months and the parents or whoever the child's parents are, are not doing what they do, at what point do you look 
beyond the parents. Uh, I have a case that's coming up fairly soon. Uh, forgive the noise, I got a contractor going on here at the house. Uh, I, I have a case coming up, you know, and I'm getting to that six months here, probably in May. Well, I know it'll be six months in May. Uh, and what point, uh, after that six months there with the kinship uh, care family, you know, what does, beyond that six months, what does the Department of Social Services look beyond that six months if the parents are not doing what they're supposed to do? I think I understand what you're asking. Um, children can be placed with their parents for up to six months before custody must be transferred. For a relative placement, there's not that six month cap. Um, so if, uh, but that doesn't mean we want them to stay in foster care forever either and just be placed with that relative without permanency. Um, so uh, usually when we go beyond uh, the, the permanency planning period, um, the foster care timeline, it's because there are some issues that we're working on with that relative. It might be to get um, disability in place for the child, something like that. Um, is that what you're going on? Uh, yes, it is, yes. Yeah, um, you know, we're, we're constantly working and, and assessing um, what the barriers are to permanency at that time. Um, and if, you know, if they appear to be, if they don't really carry the weight, those barriers that we think they should, then um, we continue looking for other relatives. Let's see here. And Miss Lewis has to ask, she'd like to see the st statistics on adoption turn-ins. Um, I don't have those right off the top of my head, but I can tell you that I have two teenagers in care right now that were turned in by their adoptive families, and I am working to get two more. Um, I'm on a notice for two more this month, so that would be four. Um, it's very rare that we have a period of time where we don't have teenage adopted turn-ins on our caseload. Um, one or two. Um, it, it's really too frequent um, not to be a huge issue for the state. Um, and, and I will say, I don't think we do a lot enough to support adoptive families once their children get to the teen years. Um, it's, it's really hard. And by that time, the adoptive family has gotten kind of distance from the agency. But, but it, it's a, a significant number of kids that get turned back in. Yeah, and we have found, so we offer post-adoption services. We have some grant services around that now because we know this is happening. Um, but what we have found is that families are just waiting too late to ask for help. Um, they're waiting until they have decided they are absolutely done where we could have maybe um, done something a little earlier. So. We are trying to get the information out there because it, it does happen very frequently. Um, but the one thing that we, we, we have seen is the relatives who adopt um, tend to put up with more and also reach out for help more frequently than traditional foster parents who go through the adoption process. Um, one of the young well, one of the teens that I'm on notice for, I went to the last hearing and both of his adoptive parents read written statements to the court about why they did not want him in their home. And the mother ended her statement by he has brought shame to our family. And the shaming factor was this teenage kid had sex. Well, I'm sorry, if you've ever met a teen, you know that they're little sexual beings and they're gonna have sex if there's any way, anyhow. Um, and it broke my heart because this teenager was in the courtroom listening to this mess, listening to both of his parents read written statements as to why he was not good enough to be in their family. And that's essentially what they said. Um, it was awful. Yeah, that's really heartbreaking to hear. And that's, you know, impetus for us to <laughs> think about why it's important to prioritize, prioritize kin and, and help families stay connected. Um, 
any other thoughts or questions um, that folks have or something they want to, you know, I think Darnell had a case he wanted to work through. If somebody has something they, they want to ask that's case specific, I think we're happy to hear that. How, how long does kinship care, the financial responsibility, uh, how long does this stay on the kinship care? If, if I'm giving the children on the kinship care and I go through the courts, it, it, the, the case proceeds through the court and I'm actually given custody under the permanency plan, I get, get custody after all this, how does, where does kinship, the, the funding for that ends? Or does it stay there for how long with the child or what have you? Are you referring to kin gap? Yeah, kin gap, yes, uh-huh. Okay. So if a child qualifies for kin gap, and again, this is not every case, um, at, today it's for um, most 14 and over as a federal kin gap program. Um, it would last until they were 18 as long as that relative um, sends back an affidavit every year saying they are continuing, they are, they are still responsible for that child and parenting that child. So it can, could, it would continue to 18. It could continue to 21 based on the child's needs and the situation. And that's 14 and, and over, that, 14 and over, Don? Yes, right now it's 14 and over, basically. Um, because we have a federal kin gap program right now, um, we are hopeful that everything is going to move forward. It looks like it is going to, but I, I can't say today when it will be in effect, but we should have a state funded kin gap program soon. We've been crossing our fingers for years. It failed last year. We're on track this year. Um, but um, the federal, the federal funding for the federal kin gap program is agencies can use it freely over age 14. Under 14, they have to get permission and rule out adoption and return home. I think we have only had one or two that we've approved across the state under 14 under the federal program. Um, and that was probably with siblings where they had an older child in kin gap and then there was a sibling that was under 14 that we wanted them to be together. But with the state funded kin gap, we can do, we can do kin gap for all ages. Um, when that comes up. And of course, I don't know what that, you know, we'll have to put it into guidance and put all the rules around it. Okay. So there, there Dawn, go ahead, uh, Sharon. I just wanted to ask, um, you say under the age of 14, an adoption has been ruled out. Does that mean adoption within the family? Does it mean adoption by the foster parent? I mean, how broad is that? ruling out of adoption it, with the consideration of the push for the family being understood yeah so when i get when i when i get those referrals I, i've had several referrals where i get them for let's say a 12 year old <clears throat> and um i i have to review the entire case and look at um, what the agency has done to try to get this child adopted um, or adopted by this relative. Um, sometimes it's a relative is saying, I don't, I don't want to upset my sister. I don't want to upset my child. And that's not good enough. Like that's not like we have to get like, uh, so w we have to make sure that the agency has done everything they could do. Like whether it's not get the, get that relative therapy or, or family therapy or, or real education about adoption versus, you know, just a custody transfer. Um, so, you know, for, I get that I've had them before for infants where they want an infant to just have kin gap and not adoption. And so it's really where the consultant is looking at the entirety of the case and seeing if, yes, they did everything they could do to get this child adopted, everything, and they can't do it. And that's a federal requirement to be able to use it. Now, when we have a state-funded kin gap program, it will be very different than that. Does that help that answer that? 
Yes, it does oh, a bit. Okay. I mean, I guess the question being going back to some of the myths that you guys talked about early on, if you have that foster parent that did indeed fall in love with that child and is saying, hey, I'm willing to adopt, you know, and why are you saying adoption's been ruled out? You know, and I guess going back to what you say, Lynchburg has the phrase, <laughs> you know, between foster parents and family, family's always going to win. But um, that's, that's, I guess it's just a new way of thinking, a new concept for me, for me personally. Right, it is. And, you know, so you have a, um, if you're looking at kin gap for, you know, a five-year-old, I, I, I have a hard time believing that there isn't somebody who would adopt a five-year-old or really just educating a family on why adoption might be better for a five-year-old as opposed to just a transfer of custody. As you know, a transfer of custody is not permanent. You know, transfer of custody is, you could have a, a relative coming back, you know, every six months to try to get a kid back or it's just, it's not permanent. So we don't call that permanence for kids. Um, there's a place for it. There's a place for transfer of custody, but obviously we really want um, permanent relationships for our kids. And it is, it's a different way of thinking. Um, it, it really is. It's a culture shift. Yeah, thank you. And Ms. Horsley is asking um, about services for relatives, our fictive kin. Um, we should not expect them to come um, completely able to meet our children's needs because our children, even they may have raised their own family just fine. Our, our children have so much more trauma and so much more negative experience than um, children have that grow up in healthy families. So it is not at all out of out of question that a relative might need a, a parent a parenting mentor or family counseling or uh, services specifically re related to that child. Um, we find often they need education about how to deal with autism and the services out there. Um, medical disorders they you know we have to hook them up with the hospital so they can uh, be given that medical training to meet the children's needs i think it i think it's very unrealistic to expect that all relatives come in um, just ready to take over the care of our children uh, we have to partner with them and provide provide the services and and help them know that it's okay to let us know that they're struggling or will struggle without the services i think we have to make them feel safe um, and, and Kathy, I must I applaud you and your group because I think through some of the family partnership meetings we have, uh, a lot of those services are identified then through that meeting. And uh, I applaud your group. Uh, you all do a really good job in that effort. Thank you. And I will say that, um, you know, there's two trainings that foster parents can go through. So there's the traditional um, non-relative resource, most places in the state use what's called the pride curriculum. And then there is a curriculum that is a pride curriculum, but designed specific to relatives called traditions of caring. And a lot of what is talked about in that training are some of the things that you are bringing up, Christy, and really helping relatives think through the new family dynamics and you know, if you're going from being grandma to now foster parent, right, your role is significantly different with that child and how do you manage it and what does that look like? And, um, you know, it is reinforcing the idea that, you know, I think relatives, we've often heard them say, like I, what Kathy was saying, I'm afraid to ask for help because I don't want DSS to come take the child. I don't want them to think I'm not equipped. I don't want them to see that I'm struggling because they're worried. And oftentimes we see, in family systems, there's some family trauma around DSS involvement. And so there's some inherent distrust there with DSS, right? And, that, and, and that's one of the things that as a system we're really trying to address and work on. But that's part of that training. Um, when I did kinship training at my local agency before I came to the state, almost every time I heard at the beginning of the training, I don't need to be, I don't need a parent training. I've parented, I know how to parent. 
That's not what that's not what that training is. This is about learning how trauma impacts behavior and how kids use behavior as a way to share what's going on with them, not because they're bad. Right. And it's really helping folks understand how that trauma impacts behavior and how to address it um, in a way that doesn't undermine the child and continue to create trauma. Right. Um, so it's, so that that's designed specifically to address kin care providers and the things that they're going through. And then one of the things that we're doing as a state to support the local departments is giving them some tools and some resources about what it looks like for ongoing support for them because their needs are different because it wasn't something they planned on, right? And so it's just a big change for everybody. Does that make sense to folks? Did that answer what you were kind of getting at, Christy? Okay. For sure. And I will- And I, I would, oh, go ahead, Christy. Well, just to kind of uh, reiterate what I put in the chat, I just, I have seen multiple family members in foster care cases, but also some um, outside of foster care cases that went through that um, kinship specific training, like I guess the amended pride, the traditions of caring um, through Lynchburg DSS. And it is transformative for them in the best possible way. Like relatives that we have seen go through, you know, like Marnie was talking about that have that family trauma around DSS. So, you know, initially at the start of the case, we perceive these relatives as combative, suspicious of DSS, not, you know, open to working with us, having a collaborative relationship. But again, that when they go through that process, they have a cohort of other families that they meet. Um, and again, um, Lynchburg, like they provide gas cards, they feed them dinner, they um, provide free child care that was pre COVID. So they really try and remove barriers. But also, um, you know, I've seen families come back from that class, much more equipped to deal with systems or even DSS agents that may still be operating under some of those myths around relative placement and they're much more equipped to really advocate for themselves to know what resources are available to them and to reach out for them um, it's just been so profoundly positive um, and it's just a joy to see yeah I think every family I worked with that was resistant at the beginning at the end said oh my gosh that was so much better than I thought this has been so helpful um, and really having an opportunity to connect to other kin, uh, kin providers is very powerful. Um, I'm sitting through a, a, a Traditions of Caring series right now, and, I, and there is a gentleman who's an uncle, and he has two of his nephews coming into care, and he almost broke down in tears. He said, I, I thought I was the only one in this position. It's so nice to hear, like, other people in my situation and um, it, it's it's a really powerful um, thing for our, our kinship caregivers to go through. So would you say that in the, sorry I just have a clarification so would you say that in this case one of the recommendation for a kinship uh, person would be to start from getting this training or contacting DSS, what is the first practical step they could do to reach out? So if they are, if they are becoming foster parents, it's a requirement. They have to participate. Um, but the Kinship Navigator program, the support network, um, if you've had a transfer of custody, if you're not a, in a foster, an approved foster parent, you can participate in that kinship support group. I'm not sure I answered your question exactly, but. I guess it practically, what would they have to do? It's not a foster uh, situation. What, I, what I'm talking about is more um, the grandma is already has a shared legal custody and she's also having the child staying with her after the removal. But grandma has um, expressed the need of having um, more support or understanding more how kinship works. I would so say for DSS? 
is it Lynchburg? Yes. Yes. So just reach out to the worker and say this grandma should participate in a traditions of caring class. It would really support her. And I can't imagine that we couldn't make that happen. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So there's also, I mentioned earlier about family first. Um, one thing we just haven't done well as a state is um, especially like outside of foster care, there are, there are so many kids that we call diversionary cases that go through, you know, a CPS or an ongoing case. Um, CPS, or we call them protection now, they find uh, a family member to care for that child. If that family member didn't come forward, that kid would have landed in foster care. And we give them custody and we're done with them. And then when this child is a teenager, they are before the court on a chin or a petition to be relieved. I mean, Kathy can tell you probably at least a third of a foster care caseload is these kids who were with relatives um, or fictive kin who can no longer manage the child's behavior and there's no support for them. So with family first coming around, so that'll be fully implemented um, July 1. Um, family first um, mandates some um, uh, prevention work that is available to relatives <clears throat> and people who get custody. So let's say a relative doesn't go through kin gap for whatever reason. They um, they don't they don't do and there's just a, a transfer of custody, but then they're struggling to keep that child. There are prevention services that then can be in place and funded through DSS. Um, to assist families to keep them out of the child welfare system. So we're really moving in the direction of just providing way more support outside of foster care, which is what needs to happen. I mean, we know how traumatic it is for kids to enter care and for their families and how hard it is to get their kids back out of our system. So there's going to be a lot, um, a lot more options for families, and a lot of agencies are already doing this. They're already, they've, because because of COVID, we've prevented, like we we postponed, I guess, um, as a better term, um, we 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 postponed the full um, implementation of Family First um, for good reason. We weren't quite prepared to do it, and agencies were struggling with many other things. But um, there will be many more options for families who are struggling. And the Kinship Navigator Program is for anybody who's caring for their relatives. They don't have to be an approved foster home. Um, and that, that, that came out of part of the Family First work um, in figuring out how we can um, meet the needs of families that are caring for their relatives outside of the foster care system. Ladies, could I ask you all a question about, we know that we have all at some point on our caseload had that heartbreaking case of like a child who's been in care for three years or longer, and we have not identified any family, um, and especially for older youth who really are able to talk with us and tell us about people they remember, relationships they had before. Is there any kind of policy that's been developed or like an exercise where we either do like come back to the table and do uh, try and look at like a family mapping exercise or like writing down eliciting past supports and positive relationships for the child to really look at it with fresh eyes and if that procedure does already exist like where is it written down how do we access it when we're in a case like that that really just needs to be jump started um, we borrowed the effort program from Albemarle. Um, it's a, a team that gets together. It has a coordinator. It, I, it's, I always get the initials, emergency family finding recruitment team. Um, when we have those children who have been languishing in care, uh, we put a referral into this team. It has uh, the coordinator, a uh, senior worker from Child Protective Services, senior worker from prevention, senior worker from uh, foster care and we start shaking the tree. We mine the case record to see 
um, any mention of families, uh, uh, our relationships in the past that we've missed, we follow up on those. We do the computer searches again. We can interview that youth um, and just look at it from many different perspectives. Um, when you find results, everybody on the team kind of divides it up. Well, I'll talk to so-and-so and then I'll talk to so-and-so and then they reconvene and um, give the uh, report out the results. And so um, that is something that um, is catching on. Like I said, we borrowed the idea from Albemarle. It was it's just a wonderful thing. We've started doing that. and policy is now directing us to, to uh, do some sort of family finding activity uh, anytime the child has a placement change. So we've got those children out there in, in residential programs who are having such problems. If when they change from one residential or another, we're supposed to be finding um, relatives. Um, we actually had a case in Bedford. Um, the child, gosh, I think he came to us when he was three and he's a young teenager now and he's still with us we actually reached out to his father. We found him on Facebook, his biological father. Um, and he's in a, in a completely different place now than he was when the child came into care. You know, people can and do change, and he has. Um, we approached him about reinstating his parental rights. Unfortunately, his child is so ill, he himself came to the decision that he could not meet this child's needs. Um, and we finally found an adoptive placement. The child's in it. but. Um, we're really kind of getting creative and, and keep going back to that that family, that biological family. Our kinship supports that used to be in place, like teachers, um, people like that. So is that- I think that's a good, oh, sorry. I was gonna say it was a good point, Kathy. You know, um, relatives that you may have ruled out three years ago, maybe in a very different spot, also, the kid may be in a very different spot. You know, you may have had a child who was really struggling behaviorally, but as they have gotten older and as their brain has changed, they're they're more manageable for a different relative um, that maybe would ha couldn't have done it earlier. So, it's it's important to just not rule these folks out forever. That's why we really like to keep kids connected to family because we know um, that as they're changed and as our as our kids are changing, they may be able to care for um, a child after a period of time. Um, and I, and I, I want to point out too that adoptions in Virginia used to be closed. Uh, the child, the parental rights were terminated and parents and family disappeared forever and that was it. Um, more and more in Virginia, the adoptions are opening up and we have several many adoptions that are occurring where the relatives, there's a plan in place, um, either through the court by court order or just an informal plan uh, with the adoptive family and the relatives where a uh, family will be involved with that child forevermore, be it just sharing pictures um, or more to um, sharing Christmases and birthdays and holidays. Um, I think it's a much healthier approach, much more realistic. Um, because um, we all know when somebody tells me I can't have that piece of chocolate, I'm going to get that piece of chocolate. And especially when kids reach their teenage families, if we completely close them out, they're going to find whatever they can, um, any way they can. And if we don't support them, they're going to feel like they're doing something wrong. So I think just uh, the opening up of adoptions in Virginia um, is bring this to a healthier point as well. well I would add, I think um, someone said that they're glad that LDSS is on board with, with kinship. I would add, there's a huge culture shift that has to happen in many agencies to really um, embrace kinship. Like we at the state are trying to get agencies to embrace kinship. I would say in this area, Bedford and Lynchburg are both fully on board, trying to look at relatives, really doing well. Um, Lynchburg is like at 37% of their cases are in kinship approval homes, so kinship approved homes. So I think 
Um, if you work with agencies who, who aren't quite there yet, um, they are hearing the message from the state that we want them to get there and we're trying to help them get there. But it does take a culture shift. I mean, it's a very different mindset to use relatives. You have to give grace. You have to give second and third chances. Relatives screw up. They do. They are not professional parents. They did not set out to parent a child who has been in foster care. They, they screw up often. So it's really important to give them grace and allow them second, third, and fourth chances when things aren't perfect. And that's, that's hard for local agencies because we want them to be in a placement where everyone does everything perfect. And that's just not what it's like. Do you, do you see that, Dawn, and maybe uh, Kathy, some of them, do you see that prolonging the child? And I'm, again, I'm speaking from a CASA standpoint. Do you see that prolonging? Normally, we're with a child for a, a year unless something traumatic happens or continues to happen. Do you see that prolonging uh, CASA's involvement in that particular case? If you give them two or three or four chances. Well, I think when I'm talking about two and three and four chances, I'm thinking like, um, you know, a situation where you have a relative who's the foster parent mm -hmm. and um, they allowed the parent um, to see the kid at the McDonald's when they were there and the parent walked in. Okay. I mean, that's just, and, and I mean, so then you have a situation where the agency is like, I told you they couldn't see the parent. I'm taking, mm -hmm. removing the kid from your home. Okay. I mean, that's, I mean, what do you do? What does anybody do in that situation? I, I mean, that's just awkward. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand that's just life, you know? Okay. So yeah, they're not supposed to see the kid. Um, they may not have handled things perfectly, but let's educate them, let's move forward, let's give them another chance. You know, I mean, there are just things that, um, that you know, ending the relationship with the relative over silly things. Yes. Um, I guess some people may not see them silly, but others might. Right. Um, it's just not, you know, you have to give them grace. So, yeah, I mean, it could prolong a case um, if you're talking about, like, you're 13 months into a case and the relative has never done anything well mm -hmm. and you keep trying to fix them. Yes, that could prolong. And that's where you have to use your assessment skills as a worker, right. as an agency, the supervisor, and say, okay, we have given this relative this, these opportunities and they're not doing what they need to do. So there comes a time where you do have to really just use your assessment skills. I'm more talking about when we have a relative who's involved, mm -hmm. working, doing a good job, and they make a mistake. Right, okay. And I'll add that, that traditional foster parents make mistakes all the time and, and we don't immediately remove the child from them. Right? Home, right? Yeah. Um, and, and these are parents that have been thinking of, you know, foster parents that have been thinking about it for years that were supposedly well-trained and prepared. And, um, so, um, you know, I think it's important to remember we're all human and we all make mistakes. And even in the best of circumstances, when you're prepared, um, and planning for it, having a child that's experienced trauma, join your family is difficult. <laughs> And it's challenging and it's exceptionally challenging when you weren't planning on it, right? And so um, I'll just say that. And I will also say, I mean, we do have to look at safety. I mean, there are times where relatives need to be ruled out as options, for, especially for placement. I mean, there are times that happens and we're not certainly saying every relative is appropriate. We're not saying that, um, but we're saying even those relatives who aren't appropriate maybe for placement might be appropriate as a connection for a child or as a support for somebody who might be able to care for that child. Um, so yeah, there, there certainly will be times where when the local agency uses their assessment skills, a relative is not that particular relative is not the way to go.
So Christy, I think you were asking about training for DSS workers and attorneys. So there is a court improvement plan and they are working on um, creating some mandatory trainings um, for judges and attorneys um, that's gonna be rolling out pretty soon, um, as well as the state is working on um, very robust um, kinship training um, for workers. And to emphasize, as has been said, it is a culture shift. It's even a culture shift for me. And I started out in prevention trying to maintain families. It should have come more naturally to me, even with my own familial experiences. But it is a culture shift. Again, people can and do change. And we at DSS are, are people like everybody else. Um, when I think back of some of the practices I embraced early in my career, I shudder. But thankfully, I've, I've learned better and I've hopefully do better. Um, but it is, it is a big culture shift, bigger for some than others. And I feel like, too, what turns you into a true believer about family placements is seeing one that's like out of this world successful beyond what your wildest dreams were. And it's those experiences that have turned me into, you know, passionate pro relative placement. So one thing you guys might think of um, doing at your at your CASA here is creating some forum for you all, maybe once a quarter, once a month, something where you have like a brown bag lunch where you, you know, share those positive experiences so that you can learn from each other and you can continue to think about this and, and talk about it amongst yourselves. Just a suggestion, something to think about. Yeah, we, uh, uh... Marty, believe it or not, we do have a Casa Connect, uh, and uh, our agency does a real good job of getting us together and talk about those things. That's awesome. You guys were nearing okay. um, one o'clock before we leave. I just wanted to thank you all so much for what you do. Um, you, I don't know if you know how wonderful you are um, in our work, but you mean so much to us and are so invaluable as we work with these children and families to get them to a better place. Thank you, Kathy. I just, you know, if there are any other questions, we'll, we'll put those out there because we do only have about 10 minutes left. Um, but I also definitely just want to thank you all so much for this training. It, it has been truly, truly wonderful and informative. And I'm so grateful for all of you taking time out of your busy schedule to do this for us today. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you from me. All right, well, are, are there any more questions? Darnell, do you have another one? No, none for me. <laughs> okay. I have a question. <laughs> I'm online by just phone only. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I was just wondering, is there anything that we can print out as a certificate for this to show that we attended so that we can turn it into our CASA coordinators? Um, your attendance is going to be captured by us. Um, Allison is already taking care of that, so you won't need to worry about turning it in. Thank you. And how do you know which county we're from? Uh, we do it by your name. Okay, so, and then do you send us an email? Is that the way it works? Yes, what is your email, just to make sure I have, uh, what is your name and email address to make sure My I have it correctly? My name is Marceline Ellis. My email is M-A-R-C-I-A-L-Y-N-E at AOL.com. Okay, thank you. Thank you, it was very a very good presentation, thank you. Um, also, there is, a, um, there is a evaluation form in the chat box, and if you guys could fill that out, I'm gonna paste the link again. That would be really awesome, thank you.
Okay, any other questions before we let everyone go? All right, well, thank you all. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks for participating so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.